but see you all here. So on this occasion, we're privileged enough to have one of those uh, people speak to us that really does need uh, no introduction. So we have um, uh, John Redwood come and speak to us, and uh, I'll turn over the floor to him straight away. He'll speak for something like uh, 20, 25 minutes. Then I shall speak for asking a few questions, various sorts, uh, probing on a few little points that he raises, and then I'll open it up to Q&A to the rest of you. John. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to make a few remarks about the background to the first coalition budget, and more generally about how Britain can earn its living in the future, and how we can restore some balance, growth, and dynamism to a rather broken economy. The story of, of the last decade was not a happy one. Uh, the government that promised to abolish boom and bust presided over the biggest boom and bust we've seen in the post-war period, a monetary policy which was destructive in its severe lurches, interest rates too low, credit creation far too strong, boom in assets, then lurch to the opposite set of errors, interest rates too high, credit too anemic, and a collapse in asset values, jobs, and productive activity. And we then moved into the punk monetarist phase in the final months with quantitative easing and money printing to create a money go round in the public sector. It worked quite well for the government and state sector. So the intention of it seemed to be uh, to keep public sector interest rates down to virtually zero, uh, to borrow very cheaply in the bond market, and to make sure the government could borrow cheaply in the government bond market by buying all the bonds they issued effectively. I might have bought slightly different ones, but the end result was about the same, uh, whilst keeping credit pretty tight and quite expensive in the private sector, uh, with the banking regulator reinforcing the message so that the banks were under a cosh to reduce their private sector lending and to increase their public sector lending. This was called rebuilding their liquidity. And again, it worked very well to keep the public sector awash with quite cheap money, uh, but it left the private sector in dire straits. A single figure, which I think sums up 2009, uh, is the change in the size of the balance sheet of the state-owned bank RBS. And you would have thought that RBS would be the bellwether or the, the one to watch if you wanted to know what the government was trying to do. Well. If, if it is, you should be very worried about what they were trying to do because uh, RBS began 2009 uh, with a 2.2 trillion pound balance sheet and it ended 2009 with a 1.5 trillion balance sheet. So at the time when the politicians were all arguing about 6 billion more or less in public spending, uh, what really mattered, I think, was a 700 billion contraction in the balance sheet of the leading publicly owned bank, RBS. Not all of that was UK contraction because of course RBS uh, is quite a large global institution. And quite a bit of the contraction took the form of winding down uh, books of financial instruments not all loan reduction by any means. But if you winnow it all through, you still end up with the conclusion that the reduction in liquidity, credit, and related instruments available to British industry and commerce was very substantial as a result of the regulatory and monetary policy being followed by RBS and by the general state banking and money credit approach. My first advice, therefore, to the coalition government, which desperately needs a stronger and more vigorous private sector-led recovery, uh, is to change the shape of the banks and to make sure that the regulatory structure allows an expansion of credit and lending to worthwhile enterprises in the United Kingdom, uh, which will require a change in the, the rules and the guidance to the banks that they were in receipt of uh, under the brown darning regime. The second thing which became apparent uh, during the latter years of the last government uh, was the massive overexpansion of public spending relative to the realistic taxable capacity of the United Kingdom economy. Even at the peak of the boom, when the revenues were remarkably strong, the government was running a sizable deficit. 
Uh, once the money, credit and banking policy plunged us into recession, uh, then the revenues collapsed and the deficit became quite unsustainable. I fear that we've had a major reduction in our taxable capacity which we have to live with from this point onwards. And that reduction in taxable capacity has come about through the changes in banking, financial services, financial asset management and property. Uh, the revenues were very dependent in their heady years, 06, 07, uh, on a huge surge of revenues from financial services, property and asset related activities and that will not be available uh, for the foreseeable future because I do work on the assumption that money and credit policy will now be rather more moderately controlled and we won't be going back into an asset and financial service bubble anytime soon of the kind uh, that we witnessed in 2004 to 2007. <coughs> if you look at the Labour government's own beliefs on how much it could tax, then I think the fairest way of judging it is to look at what they actually achieved rather than what they say now about tax. And if you look at what they actually achieved, uh, the Labour government uh, never went as high as 37% of gross domestic product being raised in taxation. Uh, they inherited a country where 34% of gross domestic product was collected in taxation uh, and they put it up by about two and a half percentage points of GDP over their period in office. They never charged as little as the outgoing Conservatives were then charging, uh, but their overall increases as a proportion of national activity uh, were relatively modest. And who am I to disagree with them? I would suggest that for a starting point on any debate on taxation in Britain, uh, we would be wise to start with the proposition uh, that Labour did establish the upper limits for how much the economy could be taxed, uh, that it, it's considerably below 40% of national income that can be taxed. No post-war government, I think, has ever gone above that level, and the Labour government never went above 37% in its 13 years in office. This is despite having a lot of very powerful and eloquent advocates in the Labour Party for more public spending, and despite having a philosophical disposition uh, to the view that a, a society is fairer, more equal and better uh, if you tax those who are successful rather more heavily. So if we are in that position, if you're with me in the argument so far, that it would be unwise to budget on a much higher proportion of national income, and if you're with me in the argument that we are not about to return any time soon to the heady levels of extra taxation on financial services and property, uh, we do have a difficult background against which to construct the forthcoming uh, budget. And it is right that the Deputy Prime Minister today, Mr Clegg, is warning us all uh, that we need to have sensible and modest proposals on public spending to start to get the deficit under control. And right to warn that most of the strain here has to be taken on the spending side because we are at or close to the limits of what can be achieved on the taxing side. To give you a little bit of context on taxation of banking and financial services, uh, in 2006-07, from memory, about a quarter of the dividend income uh, paid out by British quoted companies came from banks. And we now see, of course, two of the largest banks paying no dividend <coughs> at all, and a couple of the other major banks having been through the, the task of dividend cutting. And so you've had a dramatic reduction in the income paid out from the banking part of financial services. Uh, if we're also going to face some difficulties on the current largest dividend paying company, BP, uh, owing to the intervention of the American president, it shows the type of pressures there are on the income saving and spending side, which we must take into account uh, when drawing up plans on taxation and on spending. One of the taxes that has attracted most attention in the last few weeks has become the litmus test of some of the arguments is the rather small tax capital gains tax. 
uh, capital gains tax was introduced as an additional <coughs> tax in the lifetime of everybody in this room, I think. Uh, some of you might even not have been born when it was introduced, but it's not that long ago that it, it was introduced as a totally new tax. And it's had a very checkered history since being introduced. And it's similar in the United States of America. And having been through the evidence of the last 40 years in both the United States and the United Kingdom, I think the, the numbers are very revealing because in each of the two countries, you can make the same two claims. The first claim you can make is that the revenue was maximized when the rate was at its lowest. In the case of the United States of America, they reached maximum revenues and sustained them for a period at 15%. And in the United Kingdom, we reached our record levels of revenue when the Labour government, I think, very wisely and, and bravely cut the rate to 18%. So that evidence implies that it's quite a low rate which maximizes your revenue. The second claim you can make, looking at the 40-year runner numbers, is that whenever one or other country increased the rate, within one to two years, the revenue fell. And whenever one or other country reduced the rate, within one or two years, the revenue rose. And I say within one or two years, and there are slight differences, and I think it's related to the actual bringing in of the measure and the accounting period that it related to, because of course capital gains is quite a long burn tax, and so you can be collecting revenue a year later for decisions made a year earlier, because it's, it's paid in arrears when people complete their annual return relating to the year just gone. But the, the evidence seems to point very clearly to the conclusion uh, that if you want to cut the revenue, you put the rate up, and if you want to increase the revenue, you cut the rate. Uh, clearly there are limits uh, to that proposition, because if you started to cut the, the rate to somewhere near zero, then you would no longer be maximizing your revenues. <coughs> but it does look as if CGT is a case of a tax where the optimizing rate is surprisingly low uh, for all those who, who like high tax rates and redistribution. Why should that be? Well, I think it, it's because <coughs> capital gains tax is an eminently avoidable tax in perfectly legal ways. Uh, if you set it too high, uh, then lots of rich people, lots of rich enterprises leave your country or they don't bring their new deal to your country because they don't wish to pay the higher rate. If you set it too high, rich people and rich companies employ very good lawyers and accountants to find legal ways around the particular imposition in your country, uh, or they find ways of rooting it offshore in the way I've just described. Uh, if you're someone of more modest means, you're more likely to get caught by capital gains tax. Ironically, it's a tax on the moderately successful rather than on the super rich, because the super rich, very footloose and clever. Uh, you have a bit less discretion, but you've always got the discretion that you don't need to sell in many cases. And so again, what tends to happen, you've got a long-term investment. Uh, if suddenly you, you get offered a low rate of tax on selling the investment, you think, oh, it'd be quite nice with a bit of money in my pocket. I'm not sure that investment is going to carry on doing as well in the future as it did in the past. I don't trust these politicians. I think I'll sell it while, while the rate's 18%. Uh, if the rate suddenly went to 40%, a lot of people would say, uh, fortunately, politicians are never that consistent. There'll come a point when they get bored with the 40% rate, they'll realize they're not getting very much money in. So I'll hang on to my asset and hope that it goes up in value a bit more and we're sorted out later. So it's a tax which you can change your mind on whether you pay it or not, because there are, uh, for a lot of people, um, flexibilities over the timing of the purchase and sale of assets and the realization of gains. I argue the case almost entirely on revenue maximizing because I'm trying to advise a coalition government uh, where the minor um, party in the coalition strongly believes in much higher rates of capital gains tax than the uh, majority party in the coalition probably doesn't. Uh, so I think it's easier not to have that sort of argument and to go to the, the nub of the issue which can unite us. And the issue which can unite us is that we have a huge revenue hole as well as a huge problem of overspending. Uh, any tax decision we take should therefore be one that seeks to 
uh, maximize the revenue and improve the tax base. And I think the evidence is pretty convincing that the way to improve the capital gains tax revenues, widen the base, increase the number of transactions being taxed, is to set a rate which people think is fair, sensible, uh, or even one which they think is a bit of a bargain, uh, so that you get more transactions. Uh, after all, that's what you do in the marketplace. If you want to sell more of something, you cut the price. If you want to have less of it, you put the price up. Um, I never understand why government applies this rule to taxation on alcohol and cigarettes, where it says we put the tax up so that there's less money spent on drinks and alcohol, we cut consumption. Uh, and then they put the tax up on enterprise, but they say they want more enterprise. Uh, well, if you want more enterprise, surely the same rules apply, that you have to cut the tax rate on enterprise to show that you believe in it, to get more of it, so that you then have a bigger tax base. The issue of fairness uh, can be argued both ways on capital gains tax. Uh, some people will say that if you're rich enough to uh, have a buy-to-let property, or you're rich enough to have a shareholding, uh, you should be prepared to pay 40 or even 50% tax on any gain you make. Others of us would say that if you've been prudent enough and careful enough, that you've paid all your own bills, looked after your family, met all the requirements, and you've still been able to save on top of that, you have saved out of taxed income, you've already paid one lot of tax on it. Why should you have a particularly penal second tax for being prudent when your neighbor took the cruise or bought the bigger car and doesn't have to pay the second load of tax on, on savings and savings income and on savings capital gains? So there are two ways of looking at the, uh, the fairness argument. And I think it would be a very strange message to send at the moment that we don't want people to save more, invest more, be more prudent, to do more for themselves. We have, after all, to cut the cost of the state. And one of the biggest costs of the state uh, is being decent and caring about people who can't afford their own bills. Surely we need to send a message to those prepared to uh, take the action, to forego consumption, uh, to save for the rainy day or the difficult time in their families' lives. Uh, we should say, well done, we will not be too penal in our taxation upon you. The economic recovery we need is going to have to be vigorous, long, and sustained. Uh, we've heard this morning from the new Office of Budget Responsibility uh, that they do not believe that the 3% growth rates that the past government had put into the figures uh, for the next three years are likely or sustainable. And I fear on inherited policy that that is correct. Uh, they are talking about 2.6% for the uh, first forecast year rather than three to three and a half, and that, that may unfortunately be true. Uh, when I wrote the economic policy review for the Conservatives in opposition in the last parliament, I commissioned a piece of work on what we thought the long-term rate of growth was likely to be. Uh, I did so because I had been provoked by the Treasury suddenly increasing the long-term rate of growth of the British economy from the 2.5%, which all of us had learned at school and university and had worked pretty well as the trend rate of growth post-1945, to 2.75%. And you could all, almost feel the pain of the teeth being pulled of the Treasury officials who were asked to produce this piece of work. Uh, it was uh, carefully worded, shall we say. Uh, but there it was on the record that the government thought that the long-term rate of growth had, ex had expanded to 2.75%. I'm pleased to say the piece of work I commissioned uh, shared my prejudice, and I hope converted my prejudice into something rather stronger and better argued than the prejudice, uh, that the rate of growth had not gone up from 25 to 2.75, but had definitely fallen. The rate of growth had fallen because the economy was living beyond its means on overextended credit, and that had to be brought out of the system at some point with obvious impacts on the rate of growth and the sustainable level of activity and output. And the rate of growth had fallen because the economy has become more heavily taxed and more heavily regulated. All the worldwide evidence shows that the more you tax and the more you regulate, the slower the growth rate you achieve until you end up with a communist state where the growth rate is almost non-existent, apart from in the fiddle figures, and their living standards fell further and further behind the West as a result of 
the ultimate decisions on uh, comprehensive taxation and regulation in the communist model. Uh, the system which clearly works to, to sustain and create higher living standards is the free enterprise competitive model, and the more you can do that in a wider range of sectors, the better your economy is going to grow. We concluded in our review that we thought the long-term rate of growth on then policies was no better than 2%. And I don't think that was such a bad judgment. And I think what this coalition government has got to do is to work away at trying to raise that rate back up to 25 or higher. And that will take time and patience and sometimes some quite radical policies if we're going to get the message across and have a more sustainable growth rate. The public sector probably has around 25 million people on its payroll. Some of those deserve to be there and some of them could really do with a bit more money. And I, I'm one of those who thinks we should be very generous towards the long-term disabled. Uh, I think we should be as generous as possible towards pensioners. Uh, but there are lots of other people on the state payrolls uh, who are difficult to afford and whom we need to think about redeploying elsewhere. Uh, the most obvious six million are the six million of working age not in jobs and some of those i'm pleased to say are able and able-bodied and capable and we need to get as many of those people as possible uh, into employment and off the public payrolls uh, the more we can do that the more the taxable base of the private sector rises and the more the costs in the public sector fall and we then have about six million of us uh, in jobs in the public sector and I'm afraid to say that we are overmanned and we need to tackle that problem at a sensible pace in a civilized way as well. I've always favored in the public sector tackling it by natural wastage rather than by redundancy. It is cheaper, it is more humane and the rate of wastage is so high in the public sector that a natural wastage policy can achieve all that you can legitimately want to achieve surprisingly rapidly. Uh, MPs generally now are coming round to this view about the overmanning of the public sector, particularly on the coalition side of the House, and we believe that we should practice what we <coughs> preach, which is why our policy includes reducing the number of MPs by 10%, and some of us have taken action to reduce and control the costs of our own offices, and I've, I've got my costs down quite substantially in the last three years, and that's been done by a natural wastage policy, because uh, the main cost is clearly staff costs. So it, it can be done, and it needs to be done now across the piece, uh, generally across the public sector, freeing uh, people and resources as we try and accelerate the private sector-led recovery. My personal hope is it will be done with our redundancies. I think where we want, for example, to close down a quango or a branch of government, we may well need to do quite a bit of that. Uh, we need to have a pooling system so that there is a pool of talent for those who wish to stay within the public sector. One of the advantages of the wider Whitehall nexus should be flexibility in, in careers, promotions, transfers, and so we need to use the talent that wishes to stay. We also need to have a range of enterprise policies that are attractive to the brightest and best in the, in the public sector, uh, because we need them uh, to spin themselves off and set themselves up in not-for-profit activities, charitable activities, for-profit activities, joint ventures, whatever, to find new, cheaper, better solutions uh, to problems which the state currently tries to tackle through its own workforce and its own as assets managed often quite badly directly in the public sector. So we're looking for ways in our big society framework uh, to have those new ventures, those third-way ventures and those competitive private enterprise ventures to uh, do things better and cheaper that have been done in more traditional ways in the state sector up till this point. A whole range of policy tools have been needed. So my conclusion, because I'd like to hear your thoughts and views as your erudite and experienced audience, uh, are these, that the coalition government will succeed if at the same time as carrying out necessary value for money exercises in the public sector, it changes the mood and generates a climate in which we can have a faster and better private enterprise recovery. That the three policies it needs to change uh, to create the right climate are a banking system which can lend money to the private sector 
in sensible quantities at a sensible price, which hasn't been true in the last two years. Uh, a tax system which has attractive tax rates on saving investment, job creation and work uh, so that they are seen as worthwhile things and so that people have more chance of succeeding and keeping reasonable gains from, from their success. And a widespread policy of deregulation, uh, the easiest way of cutting business costs because we have too many regulations that are sledgehammers to miss the nut and I wish Mr. Clegg's great repeal bill every success and I have sent him 27 items to include in it uh, because I was a bit short of time when I wrote the letter <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there are another hundred that would also go down well. <laughs> broad tour of a number of different issues. Um, so uh, what we'll do now is that I, I shall uh, now probe John on a few uh, questions before I open it out to a broader uh, Q&A thereafter. So uh, you've covered many different topics, but maybe if I arrange the questions that I would want to probe you on into three sort of sets, I'll ask you a little bit about the banks, and then a little bit about CGT, and then something about public spending. So starting on the banks, um, I wonder whether you have any comments on the um, proposals for changing capital requirements uh, with the Basel III committee. So there are these proposals to considerably increase uh, capital requirements. Uh, and there's a general trend around Europe of increasing the, the, the capital requirements on the banks, you know, uh, promoting perhaps the sorts of trends that you were talking about of reducing balance sheets. Do you think that that's something which it's necessary to do eventually? Is it necessary to do at this, at this time or is it just completely counterproductive? I think it's crazy. Uh, it's bound to be deflationary. And this is exactly the wrong time to do it. And these are the same people that, in informed conversations, now agree with their critics like me when we say you need to have counter cyclical regulation, not pro cyclical regulation. And yet, here they are again going forward with pro cyclical regulation. Now, the only objection to having counter cyclical regulation <coughs> is how do you know the cycle? And that is a good and interesting question. And the, the truthful answer to that is you won't always know, and you won't always get it right. But if you can't see that this is the bottom of the cycle, <coughs> or if this isn't the bottom of the cycle, God help us. You know, it is pretty obvious this is near the bottom of the cycle, just as some of us were writing in 2007, that it is quite obvious this is somewhere near the top of the cycle. Everything is so overdone. And so what you've got to do is to have regulators with judgment who can understand that when you're at the bottom of the cycle, you relax cash and capital requirements. And when you are nearer the top of the cycle, you increase the cash and capital requirements to start taking the drinks away before everybody's blind drunk. Uh, and when nobody can get a drink and they're all dying of thirst, you need to actually let them have at least some water or maybe something stronger given a state very much. <laughs> so, no, I think it's exactly the wrong time and the wrong policy. Would it also similarly be the wrong time to be introducing a bank levy then, taking cash out of the banks? Well, as I understand it, um, they may not be taking cash out of the banks because I think the bank levy may replace the changes in corporation tax which was made at the banks. So I, I will judge it when I see what the, what the flows are like. Okay, and um, the, it, of course, can't. Um, the increased capital requirements is just one of many sorts of regulation being considered for the banking sector. One that's had quite a high profile in the UK is the idea of splitting up retail and investments um, in parts of the banking system. Is this a useful moment to be thinking about that and would you favour that sort of measure over the medium term? I think you should be looking at that kind of issue at the moment because I don't think the structure of the British banks uh, is correct or perfect in any way. I would be critical not just of money and banking policy in the run-up to 2007, which I was at the time, but I was also at the time critical of the competition policy. Uh, and if I had been running the competition authority, as, as I once did with the Secretary of State when we were in government before, I would not have allowed the mega-mergers that created RBS. I think they were not in the public interest and they were arguably um, anti-competitive in some senses. And I certainly wouldn't have allowed and encouraged the uh, HBOS merger uh, with Lloyd's. I think that was probably the worst of all the bad decisions taken by the then government and regulators during the crisis. So if we went back to having a proper competition policy, I think you should use competition policy quite strongly 
uh, to prevent any bank getting too big a market share in the British domestic banking market, because it is my view that the British domestic banking market has suffered from too little competition over a number of years. And if you are a small enterprise or a slightly distressed enterprise, it has been extremely difficult getting sensible banking on sensible terms because of the way the, the banking market operates, because you're mainly dealing with just a few mega banks. Now, on your very narrow question of investment banking, as it's sometimes called, versus retail banking, uh, I'm open-minded, but I think there are a number of problems with the simple proposition that all you have to do is to separate investment banking from retail banking and you have solved the problem. If you actually look at the crisis, uh, the British crisis struck in three specialist retail banks. It had nothing to do whatsoever with investment banking. It was um, three banks, especially Northern Rock, who were overstretched. And it's sometimes said that their mistake was that they securitized some of their loan portfolio. That was the only thing they did right. The, the securitized bit worked perfectly and didn't cause any stress. The bit that went down was the conventional bank uh, because that was too geared. Uh, but it was very traditional banking. And eventually, of course, it was a run on the deposits that took the bank down. So the very thing people now say is the solution to banking uh, solidity and uh, strength was actually the, the Achilles heel which took Northern Rock down because depositors lost confidence in the bank. And if you go across the water, probably the worst collapse was Lehman's. And Lehman's was a pure investment bank, so we, we had a test of the proposition <coughs> that these very fancy investment banks that overdo it can be allowed to go bust and we all can live happily ever after. And it didn't feel like that at the time. I mean, you can say, well, we got through it. But yes, only by propping up all the others, because we were in danger of having a concertina set of collapses of the investment banks once they let one go down. So they fought very hard to prop the others to stop that happening. So I think that demonstrated that it isn't a simple answer, and that you can still have great instability just in investment banks, or you can have great instability in retail banks uh, without bringing the two together to create even greater instability. Uh, but so my short conclusion is, I think our banks are too big. I think we need to do something about the ones that we have under our control, where we could split them up and sort them out. I would like to see three or four more serious banking competitors on the high street and available for the small and medium-sized enterprises in Britain as part of my enterprise package. Okay, well, I suspect other people might have questions about banks in due course, but um, if I move on to the question of uh, CGT, um, what did you think was wrong with the, or what do you think was wrong with the pre-1997 uh, CGT system that we had in the UK? <coughs> I don't think it collected that much money, I think it's fairly anti-enterprise. That's straightforward. <laughs> so the rationale for it, though, was presumably or it was said to be this kind of Lawsonian argument that the, the reason why CGT exists is to protect the income tax base. Um, for, further to that, there might be those who would say, look, that you have all this evidence, of course, that um, CGT rates around the world have been cut, and that led to increased CG, um, CGT take. Uh, following through the Lawsonian argument, one might be interested in the question of what happened to their income tax takes. Because it wouldn't be much use cutting the CGT rate and getting additional CGT if that just meant that you had a big fall off in your income tax revenues. Um, so, uh, does the do you think that the evidence is convincing that the total tax take, as opposed to the CGT take, um, increases when you cut rates, uh, and um, uh, thence uh, that you think that there's no real case that you protect the income tax base by having a CGT? No, the evidence from American Britain is that the income tax receipts were nearly always rising, whether you were increasing or reducing CGT, there was no evidence that it was having a, a big and dangerous impact uh, if you started to relax the rate. And in both countries, there were quite fierce anti-avoidance measures in place. I'm not against anti-avoidance measures. I think you do obviously stop the most uh, clear wheezes that could convert income into a <coughs> short-term basis. The compromise I propose to the coalition gives to the Lib Dems their favour 40% rate for one year capital gains anyway. So it, it has uh, an equation of misery between income tax and capital gains tax 
uh, for the gain of up to one year and the income out over the year. So all those issues drop by the wayside. There, there was an old idea that it might it would be better just to abolish CGT altogether, not have one, and instead have a waddles like a duck principle on your income tax. Um, do, do, which, would you, if, if one could do that politically, would you favour doing that at this stage? Well, that was the traditional John Redwood position, yes. Um, John Redwood advising the friendly coalition has come up with this uh, rather different package to raise more revenue uh, and to genuflect to those who like the idea of 40% rate. But no, I think it's better to have zero rate. And that's what the main competitor jurisdictions have. There's no CGT in Switzerland, there's no CGT in Hong Kong, there's no CGT in Singapore. Um, quite a lot of successful financial market-based economies don't have CGT for obvious reasons. And they are our competitors, but I'd be happy to settle for the compromise position I recommend. Just well, one more on this. Um, there are those who might say that the use of the reduced rate um, uh, under Gordon Brown really serves as a kind of um, industrial policy so that you provided a uh, subsidy for the private equity uh, industry. Um, do you have any sympathy for that point of view? And if so, would you think that it was justified to have such subsidies? Well, I don't call it a subsidy. I think there's a difference between a subsidy and a tax relief. A subsidy means you have to collect money from other people and pay it out to somebody. Whereas a tax relief is you just take less of their money, uh, which is, I think, the nicer way of doing it. And it's not so disruptive to everybody else. Uh, whereas a subsidy is disruptive to everybody else because they have to pay for it. Uh, so, I think, yes, the 10% rate was a brilliant idea. Uh, I think it did stimulate a lot of quite genuine and good productive activity. Like all these things, there will always be deals and examples that you or I might not approve of or don't like. That's the part of the marketplace. Uh, but a lot more happened, and we collected more revenue, so I think it was win-win-win for everybody. Well, I think we can guarantee some more questions on that in a moment, but uh, finally I just have two, two questions on spending. So, how much do you think spending needs to be cut? I'm not going to name a John Redwood figure, um, because that's always too interesting for <laughs> the media and critics. Oh, please do. Um, I've said what I want to say on what I think is the sustainable level of tax in our country, to still have a free society and economy that works. And so over a period of years, partly through growth in the economy and rising revenues from that mechanism, and partly through better value for money in the public sector, we need to get our public spending down to the sort of levels it used to be at in relation to the economy. Okay. And um, what do you think should be the priority for spending cuts? Well, I, I see it as a process more than areas. Um, I think politicians are very unwise to play the officials' game of the parade of the bleeding stumps, um, <laughs> because that's too easy to, uh, for the officials to get away with the idea that nothing could be reduced because all the ideas they come up with are politically uninviting or politically too sensitive. So I think it's about process, and it is about working away on doing more for less in many areas, as well as finding something you don't need to do. The doing more for less is about using natural wastage and raising productivity. We've had a decade when uh, throughout most of the public sector productivity was stagnant, whereas private sector manufacturing productivity rose by about 3% per annum. So the gap is now enormous. We have to apply some of the better management techniques and make intelligent use of technology so that we do more for less throughout the public sector. So you work away on the 6 million payroll uh, to achieve what you want to do with fewer people over a sensible time frame. Uh, you work away on purchasing and procurement. You could probably buy things for 10 or 15% less, so you need to work away on that. You could probably use 10 or 15% less consumables. First thing I would do is I'd have a de-stock. And you know what you do in a private enterprise when, when you're uh, a bit pushed for cash? You just tell people they can't buy things for a bit. And they soon come to the boss if something is really vital and say, yeah, I know you said that, but look, you know, <laughs> please sign the chip. And, they may be right you sign the chip. You just slow it all up. You stop them buying things. And I, I did a de-stock on, on my little office. You know, we went for three or four months without buying anything. It's wonderful. You know, it's one of the ways you, you get the cost up. You, you go over there now and look at the huge supplies of stationery and paper clips and very expensive toners and cartridges and all this sort of thing. Um, and then a lot of them are left so long that they become rubbish. You see them in the waste bins three or four years later. 
you just need to put a bit of pressure on, on purchasing. Big areas defense, where they're wanting to put a lot of pressure on purchasing, where we're learning today past purchasing has been pretty inefficient. So it's buying things, it's <coughs> staff productivity, and then of course the big one is getting people back to work. We can't afford six million people on benefits, it's as simple as that. Okay, well, um, if I, maybe now I'll uh, open it up to other questions. There should be a roving microphone. Um, you might see it, there we are. So uh, maybe quite a person volunteers. This gentleman here to begin. Peter Bottomley from the House of Commons. Um, Enterprise. In 1979, the Conservatives had one bit of denationalisation in the Manifesto of International Freight Corporation. Some of the great success came in letting gas go, free AA, BA, ports, and all the other kinds of things. What are the things that we might be able to let free now to get a similar increase in investment, better service, and in the end, more taxation rather than more subsidy? Yes, thank you, Peter. I think it's a reminder of the big task that the 80s government did, which was difficult in those days and required great political bravery by the then Prime Minister. But looking back, it was a bit easier than the task we face now. Because the deficit was smaller. And we had this huge public trading estate to all these nationalized industries, uh, where we knew we reckon we knew that if we could get them into the private sector, they would perform much better, they would produce more and better paid jobs, uh, they would create more wealth, generate more tax income. And all that turned out to be true in most cases. When we made this very substantial transfer, about 7% of national income is transferred from public trading into free enterprise and largely competitive businesses, which was a huge boost to the economy. We wouldn't have had the city's success, in my view, without the BT privatization because we had a, a rickety and out-of-date and um, totally inadequate telecom system prior to the privatization, and in a 10-year period, it caught up with, and in some cases, surpassed America uh, by introducing competition and leaving BT free. There's no such easy wins today, apart from the banking sector. And the really big area where we, we can do something similar is to sort out RBS and Lloyds and return those to the private sector in suitable forms uh, so that we can energize um, the, particularly the British-based part of those businesses in a way which supports and develops the rest of the free enterprise economy. So I think that's the, the crucial area. I think then we're, we're going to be looking at a whole raft of small solutions across local and national government. Uh, where public sector managers perhaps lead, lead employee buyouts of, a, of an activity or they spin themselves off and set up a charitable activity to do the job. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of work looking at whether we can deliver uh, a much better set of measures to promote work and training uh, to work away at those six million unemployed. So we think there may be third sector solutions and private sector solutions that are much better at doing that. I think a lot of the work being done with Smiths team in his policy review uh, was very productive. He's actually gone out on the ground and shown how you can do drug rehabilitation and uh, uh, improve the skills and motivation for uh, young people who otherwise lack them uh, through third sector and charitable enterprises. And I think he'll be doing much more of that as he gets to grips with his job. This question. Uh, this uh, lady here, uh, Hello, yes, Laura Miller from IFA Online. Um, I was just wondering what you do anticipate the CGD changes, changes to be in the, in the budget. Are we likely to see um, potentially 10 to 20% for employee held shares? Um, what's, what's your perspective? CGT? Mm. Well, my, my proposal uh, is a very simple one, that you tax one year gains at 40%, you tax two year gains at 30%, you tax three year gains at 20%, so they're all higher rates than the current rate we have, I regret to say. Uh, you tax four year gains at beyond that 10%. And I think that would give you more revenue than you've got at the moment. It would meet the requirement to have more penal rates for short term gains. And it would obviate the need for a whole series of exemptions for employee share schemes and self-run businesses and all that kind of things. Everybody would face the same regime 
and you can say to anyone in an employee share scheme or running their own business or whatever, if you can be bothered to do it for four years, you get a lower rate than you got today. I think that's a great proposition. <coughs> and the gentleman next. Thank you, Richard Barron, Institute of Directors. If I can bring in what we can expect to be the other big tax topic in next week's budget, and that's corporation tax reform. Obviously, there have been all sorts of things floating around. There's talk about trading corporation tax rates for allowances, which probably has to mean the main rate of capital allowances. Before the election, Conservative front benches were looking at interest rate deducti interest deductibility and whether companies should be just able to deduct all of their interest expense. <coughs> Um, you know, several ideas around there, and there's been talk about simplifying control for foreign companies regime. I wonder if you have views on what ought to be in that five-year roadmap for corporation tax reform that we've been promised. The, the stated policy, you may remember, was to take the corporation tax rate down to 25%, uh, but to pay for that by removing the investment allowances. So people objected that this was anti-manufacturing industry and pro-banks and that's where I think the, the banking levy came in because that basically recouped from the banks depending on the numbers the benefit they were going to get out of the corporation tax change. And I think this was a policy driven by uh, one very healthy instinct and by one grim reality. The healthy instinct was that the then conservative opposition desperately wanted a lower corporation tax rate to send a message to the world that we wish to be tax competitive. And the headline rate is probably the most important thing that people look at when they're running their numbers and looking at where to go around the world. But the grim reality was that the then shadow chancellor didn't feel he had a whole load of money he could put in to cutting the rates, so it had to be <coughs> self-financing. But we will see where he is in his thinking in a few days' time but that is where he was coming from. What do I want? Well, I want a competitive Britain. I want this fast to grow sector led recovery. So I will be supporting any such move to lower the rate, even if it has to be paid for out of <coughs> removing the allowances. And I will be urging that we go further and faster over the years ahead. And if we can start doing it without having to recoup it all, that will be very positive for the recovery of the business because what does business needs? It needs more free cash flow to spend on jobs and new investment and new plant and new machinery. Britain now ought to be super competitive because we've had a 25% devaluation over the last couple of years. And in many ways it is now very competitive thanks to the devaluation. But if you look at what a lot of businesses are doing that can or should export, they are preferring to take quite a lot of the benefit of the devaluation in the form of higher sterling prices uh, so that they're generating more cash and profit uh, instead of taking it on more volume. Now, one of the reasons they're in that position is our old friends, the banks. Uh, rightly or wrongly, a lot of those businesses don't feel they would get the lines of banking credit necessary put in the extra machines, put in the extra lines on the factory floor and to manage the extra working capital. It's the first thing that happens when you are running an expansion of exports or any kind of expansion is your working capital shoots up. It's quite difficult to control it and manage it well. So you need good banking lines. A lot of companies are saying, we've just been through hell with the banks. They've told us to get into shape. We're still improving our balance sheets. So whoopee, the pound's lower, we're going to make more profit. And that's what's happening. That's where we need to sort the banks out to get it right. What about this question about um, interest deductibility of debt? I mean, do, do you think that the switch, the, the change in the surplus ACT regime in the early 90s was, might have been a factor, albeit perhaps a small factor, in the build-up of indebtedness relative to equity and the economy through the, the 20 years? Uh, and would you favour um, trying to reverse some of that sort of impetus now with taxing debt interest? No, no. Okay. So pretty clear. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think there was a gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Patijn. I had a more general question, actually. I mean, throughout Europe, you see that governments now have to cut their deficits, and throughout Europe, uh, those cuts are opposed by mostly the left, according to the same. 
uh, arguments uh, people want to avoid short-term pain. And the arguments you put forward are rational arguments like tax optimization and that, uh, things like that. But how do you expect to win the emotional argument coming from still something like 50% of the population who don't want to take the short-term uh, pain? Well, that's the test of political skill, isn't it? I, I think the mood of this country has become quite serious. I think it shifted before the election. And I think we've been in a position for a little while where a majority of the British public has been in favor of stronger action to sort out public sector costs than the politicians. The politicians are just catching up. Um, now, I made very clear to my electors well before the election and throughout the election campaign, what I thought the state of public accounts was, and how we were going to do, need to do a lot more than six billion off, which was the currency of conversation uh, nationally at the time. And I got a very nice swing to me, and I'm very grateful to all my electors who trusted me. Uh, so it, it proves that you don't necessarily lose if you tell people the truth. You don't necessarily lose if you tell people public sector has to live within its means. Okay. Yeah. Mark Katz, Nellan Logan, Florian Capital, your taper relief... Maybe, maybe if you just wait for the... Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, your taper relief proposal for CGT um, will condition economic behaviour in perhaps an unfair way. I mean, if you want to help savers, why should they? Just because they don't happen to be, say, within a tax-effective collective vehicle, why should they have to hold an investment for four years that, say, fund manager wouldn't have to hold, and um, if Washington the Save then be free to do what they want without being conditioned by, by a time taper charge in that way? Because we have a coalition government. Mm -hmm. I think it's the fairest system in the circumstances. I mean, if you can't be bothered to wait for four years, then maybe you should pay a bit more tax. <laughs> <laughs> So, robust line. Uh, who else there? There's a gentleman here with the red tie. Thank you. Uh, Martin Bloom. Uh, I'm chairman of a Chinese company. I've spent about a quarter of my time there. I just want to make one perception because in your preamble, you compared it with the success <coughs> of capitalism with the failure of communism. I should just point out that China has actually found a third way and is probably the most dynamic economy at the moment and will continue to be so. Now, all I would say is that we shouldn't write China off. We should be aware of the fact that if we want to build an economy based on private enterprise, we have to realize that in some cases we will be competing with Chinese companies internationally. No, I, I have um, great respect for the recent Chinese achievement, and I've written a great deal about how we are going to continue to find it very difficult to counter the super competitiveness of quite a lot of Chinese industries and businesses. But it's not communism that's doing that. And when they were a pure communist state, they, they were not only extremely badly governed with no civil liberties, but they were extremely poor. The reason they have a very fast growth rate at the moment is they have a lot to catch up on uh, because communism made them so poor or kept them so poor for so long. Um, you know, if, if China matched American living standards, then obviously she'd be four times the size of America. Her economy is still not as big as America's, showing that her living standards still haven't even reached one quarter of the level of American living standards. So I think China needs a little bit of humility about her past economic progress, uh, whilst we can be suitably impressed by the speed of her improvement or recovery in the last decade or so. I think the Chinese system of managed capitalism can work for quite a long period. Um, it doesn't make it a very nice society because you don't get civil liberties and the same kind of political conversation, but you can get very fast economic growth. One of the reasons, I think, is that anyone who's clever, bright, radical becomes an entrepreneur because it's far too dangerous to be a politician. Because um, you, you have to be 70 years of age and speak from the official songbook, otherwise uh, you're not allowed a, a chunk of power. So people learn the idea that it's better to be an entrepreneur. An awful lot of talent goes into free enterprise, which in a Western society might go into government or in, into politics. Um, 
But another reason is that, of course, it's state-managed capitalism, and they free the market as much as it suits them. Uh, so you have an arranged exchange rate to keep China very competitive. Uh, and you're quite free to operate in China as a foreign company as long as it's for export. Uh, but if you wish to interfere in the domestic market, as you may do or you, you may know, then you can be subject to all kinds of restrictions and interruptions to your progress because there is still a lot of management going on. Uh, so it's not a model I recommend for Britain. Definitely, yeah. I, I think I'm going to try three questions in a row now because the number of questions are building up today. So I'll take uh, this gentleman here first, and then it'll be you, sir. Um, um, my name's Charles Alexander. Uh, John, three years ago I did, uh, I chaired a CBI task force on the competitiveness of, of UK corporation tax and I was listening carefully to a colleague from the IOD. One, one thing that we recommended there, which does not seem to me yet to have penetrated the political debate included on the media, is the necessity within the Treasury for the use of dynamic models. Of, of, of income prediction, um, like it is now being trialed in the United States. And by dynamic models, I mean what you referred to in your remarks on several different occasions in several different categories of taxation. Namely, you reduce the rate and you increase the revenues. This is a proven fact, including in this country and many others throughout the world. But it has not yet, I don't think, reach the level of political debate which should illuminate what is going on with the current decisions being made by the coalition and the opportunity that the coalition has to inform the debate in the future on this point, uh, particularly on small and medium enterprises rate of corporation tax, which should be a flat rate and very low. So my question is, uh, what in private, economists and politicians and even in the Treasury they admit that this is true, but in public it has not penetrated, particularly in the BBC, who just don't understand it. So, my question to you is, is there any chance, politically, of introducing what seems to me to be a very important element of investigation into the, the taxation debate? Okay, and to you, sir. Um, Pete Peter Hall from Hunter Hall, an investment management company. Um, a, a very long-term um, and structural issue is the national debt. Um, I come from a country, Australia, where we've actually repaid all our national debt. And is it, um, a, it the world has, will have fewer resources and more demands placed on it. Um, and is it, uh, where, where does it sit in Conservative Party thinking, the issue of should we actually repay, be trying to repay our national debt at some stage 15 or 20 years from now? Okay. And you, Thanks. Uh, Kate Smith from Shell. Um, I just wondered, Mr. Rebel, what friendly advice you might give those in the coalition who would be looking towards the oil and gas sector potentially for uh, increased revenue? Okay, so three questions there. So one was about um, how to get the public understanding about the dynamic effects of taxes. The second was should we repay the national debt? And the third was about um, whether the oil and gas sector might be an attractive source of revenue. I would not recommend any special taxes on the oil and gas sector. We have a separate energy crisis in Britain where the lights will be going out in five or six years' time if we don't make some quick decisions on uh, how to generate more electricity. And we certainly need all the oil and gas we can procure from uh, near our shores. So I would recommend no extra special taxes. On the national debt, uh, we're so far away from any prospect of being able to re <laughs> repay any national debt that, you know, ask me in five years' time. Uh, 15, 15 or 20 <laughs> we, years. We are trying to stop the debt going up at an unsustainable rate. And if we stop the debt going up, we would have a major victory. And I think we'd then want to um, pause for a little bit of congratulation and maybe some kind of national dividend uh, as a reward for having done something that looks almost impossible. On uh, Charles's question, and that's the argument I'm trying to give public prominence to at the moment. I've been working away on this for several years. Uh, CGT has enabled me to get a much bigger audience. And although at the moment the argument is focused on just one tax, the principles apply to 
to other taxes as you rightly say, and I'm trying to use the interviews and the coverage available to widen the argument and to say there is this general point. And as always, I think you need a, a soundbite in this soundbite culture to try and get people to think differently. And that's why I've come up with this soundbite that when we went to, want to stop smoking, we increase the taxes. When we want to stop drinking, we increase the taxes. So do we want to stop enterprise? Because we seem to be increasing the taxes. And so far, Labour haven't come up with an answer to that. And it's always very good when you've got a soundbite that they haven't learned how to counter. Uh, you have a window of opportunity to get your soundbite out there. All of you can help if you agree with, with my argument. And the more independent and external endorsement and the more voices that we get saying the same thing, the better it's going to be. The BBC have at last recognized this argument. <coughs> and they rang me last week and invited me on to some show of theirs uh, to discuss why I was at variance with the IFS who'd come out and said I was pretty wrong. And unfortunately, the, their timing didn't coincide with mine, so instead I wrote the reputation on my website. Uh, and I subsequently heard over the weekend one of these new truth slots where they'd <laughs> taken, taken somebody's proposition uh, from the public wheel and put some unknown economist on to <coughs> dealing with it. And I couldn't believe it. I, I got away with it. They, they concluded that I wasn't necessarily wrong, which I thought was <laughs> pretty high praise. It was all the other ones I've heard. The poor guy who made the claim was, was clearly a liar or a cad, and the, the claim was dismissed. And the funniest thing of all was that the IFS got it in the neck because they were explicitly asked by the BBC what they thought the optimum rate was to maximize the revenues, because they agreed there was such a rate, my proposition. And they said they had no idea. Uh, and so they were asked, well, you've spent all these years studying CGT, you're the independent experts, why don't you know what the optimizing rate is? And until they can come up with a plausible answer to that, I think I'm in a very good shot. Do you have a view on whether we're above or below the optimizing rate for VAT? Mm -hmm. No view at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a try. Um, so, next, let's try some more questions. So we'll have the gentleman here with the glasses. Um, Rob Mesri from Goals UK, I work with uh, many of those six million you, you mentioned helping them get back to work. Um, you speak about as you, as you lower taxes, perhaps you, you increase the revenue. Uh, is this something which is supported independently? And if it is, would it be a job to let go of the responsibility for decision making in terms of maximising revenue and letting someone else, like the Bank of England, similar to the Bank of England, make that decision? Uh, and, and then that'll be a long-term policy. Okay, and the uh, gentleman behind. Thank you very much, my name's Peter Lloyd. Um, can I ask a question about the apparent paradox in the Conservative Party line, which is that there's a lot of uh, um, pressure to keep bashing the banks, to encourage um, higher capital ratios, to have higher, more regulation, and generally to make life more difficult for them, at the same time as the base proposal, which is that we need uh, more lending, rapid economic growth, uh, and these are not squared off. I just wondered how that could change. Okay, and the lady up. Thank you. Uh, Lena from Hello, everyone. Uh, first, it's a comment and a question. In fact, it's linked to the last one. It's about growth. Um, now, I'd like to applaud you for your views on growth and, um, and taxation. I think I agree with you. The best uh, favour that the government can do to the economy at the moment is to uh, uh, help it get rid of um, sustainable public sector liabilities in the banking system as a, as a means towards uh, creating a stable economic environment. Um, I think the experiences from the Eurozone are pretty clear. But of course, this is just a, a means to an end, and the end has got to be growth. And uh, let's face it, the reason why I feel like the Keynesian cyclical um, tools of policy have been so overexploited in the last couple of years to the point of creating a sustainable public sector debt um, amount in a growth base, and of course, the fear of currency debasement is that the structural mechanisms of the economy are not working. Um, Forgive me if I sound a bit cynical here, but in terms of cutting the budget deficit, it is a very important point, but it's one that we can easily hire the IMF to do. 
um, uh, without spending too much time on public debate about it. But it's the growth, it is about the economy structure and its position in the global economy going forward. Now, in particular, the, the money multiplier effect. Are you um, still supportive of the idea of uh, government capital support for banks, for particular bank lending activities, or is there anything else? And do you have any views on securitization and how that might be brought back in terms of optimizing rather, rather stretched bank portfolios and, um, of course, the resources of the broader global capital markets? Okay, so three questions there. So one was, should we have an independent commission of revenue maximization? Uh, second was um, what about the paradox of governments demanding increased capital ratios at the same time as demanding more uh, lending. And the third one was to know um, whether, whether you thought that there were ways of getting more securitization and whether you were um, still supportive of measures that might support um, capital uh, of the banks. On the first one, I don't think we should be recommending any more public sector bodies, so no, I, I wouldn't favour that. If somebody wants to set one up privately finance, that's fine by me. Uh, clearly we need a bit more research into this area, because at the moment there is no reliable text you can turn to that will pinpoint the shape of the Laffer curve. Most people know that there is a Laffer curve, but they're a bit uh, hesitant to, to draw it with any numbers on the graph. And that's what we're arguing about. And it is my simple case that it's quite a low rate for maximizing the CGT. And we need to do similar work for corporation tax, which I haven't yet done. Uh, I'd also say that in a democracy, ultimately, the elected officials have to take the can. So in a democracy, ultimately, the elected officials have to supervise the decisions. And I give it a great pity that the decisions of the Monetary Policy Committee and the Bank of England were, were not better supervised uh, in the period 03 to 08, uh, whereas of course they were strongly overridden on at least a couple of occasions uh, during the course of the crisis, and rightly so. Uh, on banking, my view is as I set out that I think the emphasis should be on uh, creating a regime in which the banks can do the job that we want them to do, which is to lend more money. I'm not persuaded that we need to have further expensive public sector schemes to prop up and encourage the banks from here. Uh, I think it's possible to create freestanding independent banks from here that could do the job we need to promote and finance the recovery because there have been huge changes in bank balance sheets over the last three years, uh, as I briefly described in one case. Uh, so we start from a more stable position. Part of the reason we start from a more stable position is that, of course, a lot of the really bad debt was transferred into state hands or into state guarantee. And we need to look at that and decide how much that needs to remain true, that that is still under the existing underwriting and guarantee arrangements. But I see no need to add any new problems and liabilities to the state sector over banking, and I see every reason to get on with the task of getting as much of the risk of liability back into the private sector as possible. How quickly do you think that you could actually privatise some of these banks? Is that a first parliament task or is it? Well, you could privatise them in two months if you wanted to, but that may not be the sensible thing to do. Uh, it may be sensible to spend a bit more time allowing them to rebuild and helping them rebuild so that they are more valuable properties or groups of assets to sell on. Other questions. And we're going to lose money on it. And you know, it's a complete myth that because the share price occasionally gets above the purchase price, you're making money. Because that ignores the fact that you've had all this transfer of risky liabilities to other parts of the public accounts. Other questions? Um, David Acker, Mortgage Orient. I'm, uh, you've expressed how you feel about large corporations and corporation tax needing to be reduced. How do you feel about the part that needs to be played by smaller companies and startups and the lower corporation tax rate there? Most of the, the new jobs are likely to come from small and medium-sized enterprise rather than from big business. That is what past evidence shows. There's no reason to suppose it's going to be different in the future. So I, I'm very much of a view, as I think the government is, that, that we need to have a much more business-friendly culture for startups and for small enterprises. It is quite difficult getting into business 
it is very difficult taking on your first employee when all sorts of regulatory requirements are visited upon you and it is quite difficult moving into your first serious business premise out of your home or your garage or whatever you started in. All those things have huge regulatory and set up costs that deter all but the most valiant of the system. And we need an enterprise culture where you can set up your business if you're mediocre, if you're not that energetic at the moment, you need to be a sort of intellectual titan and extremely energetic person to cut through all of this and to put up with the slings and arrows you get. And we need to just relax the, the climate a bit so that more people can see uh, small enterprises is a call for them and that there are fewer barriers in the way of expanding the enterprise and the stars to work. Okay, well, we're coming to the end now. Um, and uh, so I'd just like to uh, thank John for his um, informed, imaginative, robust, and yet disciplined <coughs> uh, speech uh, today and his um, answers to the questions. Uh, and uh, I hope that we might thank him in the usual way.